Did government ministers fail to act when they could have saved lives of those affected by contaminated blood supplies? Tonight, the deaths of nearly 1,800 people as a result of contaminated blood products are usually called a tragedy. But were they entirely an accident? An inquiry today declined to cast blame, but could health ministers at the time, including one Ken Clark, have done more to protect haemophiliacs? Decisions were made um, in full knowledge that they were going to risk people. So, yes, I think ministers need to take responsibility for their actions. The shaky steps of a man released from four years in Guantanamo Bay. He, he says he's grateful to Britain for offering refuge. But what did Britain know of his interrogation there? It's that man again. Millions in donations from the Conservative deputy chairman are under scrutiny. And a slumdog millionaire sweeps the board at the Oscars. Could this signal a marriage of Hollywood and Bollywood? Good evening. HIV, hepatitis C, variant Creutzfeldt, Jakob disease. The conditions contracted are horrific enough. Worse is that they were given to people in the course of treatment in the National Health Service. The scandal of contaminated blood is the most serious of its kind in the history of the NHS. The first comprehensive inquiry into how it happened stopped short today of blaming individuals. Of course, no one necessarily did it deliberately, but our science editor, Susan Watts, has been investigating whether this really was all just an accident. I'm Hayden Lewis. Um, I was born in 1956, just across the bay here, um, in a lovely little house that overlooks Cardiff Bay. Um, our favourite games were gully jumping and, and crab fighting. I was diagnosed with haemophilia at the age of two. Bit my tongue, actually. Fell out of a high chair. Hayden was one of 4,000 British haemophiliacs injected with contaminated blood. Nearly 1,800 have already died. I've now reached the tender age of 52. And in all the years I've been treated for haemophilia, I've been exposed to hepatitis B, hepatitis C, hepatitis D, hepatitis E, HIV, and VCJD. The doctors didn't tell Hayden in time that he had HIV, with awful consequences. Unfortunately, through not being informed by the physicians, I've inadvertently infected my wife with HIV. Hayden and his wife, Gaynor, came to London for today's announcement. Successive governments have refused to hold an official public inquiry. Lord Archer had no power to call witnesses or compel government to act, but he could set out what went wrong. The procrastination in achieving national self-sufficiency to avoid the use of high-risk blood products from overseas had disastrous consequences. Had self-sufficiency been achieved earlier, the scale of the catastrophe would have been significantly reduced. Lord Archer decided not to point the finger of blame at any individuals, but the evidence submitted shows there were two key periods of time when mistakes were made, during the 1970s and the 1980s. And many haemophiliacs blame the ministers who were in charge at the time. Ministers should, should uh, take that responsibility. You know, if we, if we look back on what's happened, we know what's happened. It's been well documented. They, they must have known, they must have been aware uh, but to a certain extent, they shut their eyes to what was going on um, and, and nothing was done. Decisions were made um, in full knowledge that they were going to risk people. So, yes, I think ministers need to take responsibility for their actions. Haemophiliacs had always had difficult lives, but from the early 1970s, a simple treatment called Factor H became available, which seemed to be a breakthrough. It restored the ability of their blood to clot, but there was a problem. Britain relied on imports of Factor VIII from America, and the Americans paid prison inmates and drug addicts for blood which was often contaminated with hepatitis and other viruses. 
The first missed chance to save haemophiliacs from hepatitis came under a Labour government in the mid-70s. David, now Lord Owen, was then the health secretary. He was aware of the danger from imported American blood, so he tried to make Britain self-sufficient in Factor VIII, made from healthy blood from volunteer British donors, but failed. The decision was taken to go for self-sufficiency, and somewhere between 76 to early 80s, that was uh, swept, pushed on one side progressively, and Parliament was never informed, and people were given to believe that there were safeguards would be put in place and safeguards were not put in place. The second missed chance came under a Conservative government. In March 1982, warnings started to circulate in the Health Department about a new virus that had infected 400 haemophiliacs in the US, what became known as HIV AIDS. Half of the Factor VIII bought from commercial companies is imported from the USA, where drug addicts attempted to give blood simply for the money. A senior health official warned that the department might have to block that tainted blood being imported by revoking licenses of certain manufacturers. But nothing was done and the chance was missed. In May 1983, the focus shifts to Britain. The Lancet Medical Journal reports that a haemophiliac in his 20s has contracted a life-threatening disease, AIDS, from infected blood products. The reaction is immediate. The story hit the newspapers and the Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher was questioned in the House about why the government had ignored warnings about contaminated blood products from America. Will the Prime Minister rectify that deplorable and disgraceful mistake by immediately authorising the necessary expenditure within the National Health Service to make Britain independent in its blood supplies? Within a week, the government's chief advisor on public health surveillance, Dr Nicol Galbraith, wrote to the Department of Health to tell them unequivocally that he has come to the conclusion that the risk from AIDS meant that... All blood products made from blood donated in the USA after 1978 should be withdrawn from use. His letter went to the Committee on Safety of Medicines, but this was to be the third missed chance. The experts at that meeting decided not to stop imports of American Factor VIII. As a result, haemophiliacs continue to be exposed to HIV infection. If the Department of Health had acted on Dr Galbraith's warnings, hundreds of people could have been spared from HIV infection. Many haemophiliacs blamed the health ministers at that time. I cannot comprehend how they could ignore the warnings. So when a health minister is told that there is this really severe threat to the public and to specifically a haemophilia patient group, how else is a politician meant to react but stop at all cost that actually getting into contact with the human population? One of the health ministers, Kenneth Clark, was asked in the Commons about imports of plasma and blood products. Campaigners accused him of giving a crafty answer which obscured the true situation. As far as I know, no human blood plasma is imported into the United Kingdom by the NHS. Haemophiliac campaigners say he should have known Britain was still importing infected Factor VIII. Kenneth Clark specifically was playing games in many of the answers he gave politicians who were concerned about the risks. One donor whose identity only became known... As Lord Archer highlights in today's report, Kenneth Clark continued to make reassuring noises. Meanwhile, the NHS carried on injecting haemophiliacs with infected blood and some of them started dying of AIDS as a result. There is no conclusive evidence that AIDS is transmitted by blood products. A Conservative spokesman told Newsnight, in the Archer report, Mr Clark was referred to only once and was not subject to any allegations, let alone an adverse finding. Britain dealt with this differently from other countries. In France, the health minister and a former prime minister were charged with manslaughter for their role in allowing infected blood to be given to haemophiliacs. Lord Owen is suspicious that Whitehall got rid of documents that might have led to similar charges here. 
Personally, I do think the fundamental question is, did the civil service collectively, if you like, at some stage in the middle 80s, take fright at what was happening legally in France with the case against the former health minister, who by then had been prime minister, uh, Fabius, and did they decide that they were going to effectively make sure that that couldn't happen in the UK? And there are a lot of pointers in this report which indicate that. The haemophiliacs have received small ex gratia payments, but in Ireland, the government paid out ten times as much. First, we want to say to the government, you really ought to be a little more generous than you've been up to now. Many other countries which have had a similar disaster are paying much more money to those who were infected because they're in need. They have lost their jobs and things of that kind. And what we want to say is, without suggesting any specific amounts, um, we thought an indication would be what the government of Ireland is paying for them. But for Hayden, compensation won't put everything right. The hepatitis C, which was injected into him in the infected factor eight, has damaged his liver and led to cancer. Now I've reached the stage where a liver tumor has um, appeared in my liver. It's at the stage of three and a half centimeters. If it gets to five centimeters, I'll be taken off the transplant list. I cannot get any more prioritized than I am at the moment. And unfortunately, it's down to fate. If I get one, I'll be saved. If I don't, I will die. Well, with us now, Judith Willits, one of the authors of Lord Archer's report, and Andrew March, a haemophiliac who contracted both HIV and hepatitis C through contaminated blood treatments. Um, Andrew March, what are your feelings about this report? Well, I welcome the report as a very important milestone, but I, there are some aspects of it that I would like to have seen go further than they, they have. Specifically? Um, blame, the distribution of blame, or, you know, if that was counterproductive, perhaps we, you know, we could just, you know, suggest what areas could have been improved in more detail. Judith Willits, did the Department of Health cooperate with you in this report? Uh, they refused to give oral mm. evidence. Uh, they cooperated in the, uh, the production of certain documents. Did they produce all the documents you wanted? Uh, I don't know because there was some, uh, we believe there was some missing, so we don't know mm. what we didn't see. There were quite a lot missing, apparently, according to various people who knew, yes. like Lord Owen, for example. There were ministerial documents mm. that went missing as well. Uh, did uh, the Health Secretary, Kenneth Clark, testify to you? No, he didn't, no. Would you have liked him to? Uh, we did extend invitations to the department and to ex-members of the department to take part, but the line was always that they had never. Uh, felt that it was appropriate to have a statutory inquiry, so they didn't feel it was appropriate to present evidence to our inquiry. I don't want to suggest your effort was a waste of time, because clearly it wasn't. But it is not a comprehensive answer to what happened, then, is it? No, we've tried to examine the, the evidence that, uh, that, that we, were, we were party to. It isn't a full picture. Um, one of the problems that we encountered was the fact that the problem began such a long time ago. You're talking about, you know, 30 years ago. Um, and many of the people we'd have liked to speak to, and many of the recollections of those people, that, uh, many of them are actually not even alive anymore. Some so of them are not patching. alive, and plenty of them are alive. Mm. And plenty of documents have strangely disappeared. Uh, yes, we, we've, we've said that we haven't got access to all the documents, but we were well, provided with... We were told with, some of them with, don't exist, isn't that the case? Uh, or can't be found. Have been and were lost, uh, mislaid, um, accidentally destroyed. Do you believe that explanation from the Department of Health? No, I, I believe there's been a, a definite cover-up of, of the information. I, you know, various documents um, weren't released in the FOI that came directly from the department. Um, campaigners had to source these documents um, under their own initiative. For um, compensation to be payable, um, would you not have to demonstrate that there was some intent on the part of the department or ministers or something? Well, intent's a very hard thing to prove, um, but I do believe there was wrongdoing. So I, 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 we, we could what do you mean wrongdoing? Wrongdoing, oh, goodness me, um, non-adherence to the Medicines Act is an example, um, with the under, under fours uh, rule of n not exposing them to uh, contaminated con um, commercial concentrates that you know 
organisations didn't follow their own guidelines. Do you conclude that there were commercial considerations which overrode considerations of patient care in this case? I think the producers of the product in America certainly had commercial interests at the forefront. It was run as a profitable industry. Well, of course, it was a, it was a company. Yes. But as far as the Department of Health was concerned, mm. uh, did you get a sense or a fear on the basis of the incomplete evidence you were given that the department here was more preoccupied with conser commercial considerations than it should have been perhaps at the expense of patient care? No, I think they were not preoccupied enough for the problems that we've heard about, for example, that, that of achieving self-sufficiency. Therein lies the problem. If we'd, if we'd had more sense of urgency of actually achieving self-sufficiency, the requirement for buying in the product from, from America would have been considerably lessened. May I just come back to your Please. point on, on compensation? Yeah. Um, I do think that there are plenty of precedents for compensation being paid out with any, any uh, admission of liability whatsoever. Uh, victims of crime are given compensation, and there's no notion there that, that the government is responsible for those crimes. And I think it's very important that we address the needs of the haemophilia patients and actually so, put something in place so to address that So what, what do you want to see happen? I would like to see the recommendations of the report implemented. I think it's very important that we have uh, appropriate financial recompense for those affected. Uh, we've also made recommendations for a statutory committee to be set up. Do the recommendations go far enough? Some of them do, yes. Um, the, the idea of compensation you know, would be very much welcome if it was on a level with the Republic of Ireland, but it, there, there are campaigners that, that are not happy with this. Some people are very distraught that that uh, you know they, they've been exposed to non-consensual research that you know they're not going to be so happy with this and perhaps mm. they may feel as though they're being bought we actually found no evidence of of that of people being used as as guinea pigs as has been suggested uh, the evidence that that we were presented with didn't bring that out at what all what about the MRC minutes of 1983 though there, there, there were um, people that were that had HIV infective products specifically aimed at them because they didn't uh, have HIV at that time and the situation in the United Kingdom was lagging three years behind America. Well we don't have direct evidence of that. One thing that I do think we're, we're very concerned about was the fact that people with a very mild form of haemophilia were prescribed a product with a known risk and those should be the last people that that's prescribed to and we did have evidence of that through the inquiry. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank you.